Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special Times Talks during Ad Week, just for Ad Week, presented by our Times Talks sponsor, Continental Airlines. It's truly an honor to have such an accomplished filmmaker on our stage today. He is a three-time Academy Award winner and the creator of many hit movies, including the iconic Wall Street, and now, Wall Street Money Never Sleeps, with Michael Douglas reprising his Oscar-winning role as the Machiavellian Gordon Gecko. And as you know from the Times coverage in the past few weeks, in business, the Sunday Magazine, movies, and deal book, Wall Street Money Never Sleeps is the most talked about movie of the year, rising to the top of the box office in its first weekend. You'll hear much more from our guest and about the film in just a moment, but first I'm delighted to introduce our moderator. For the past 25 years, he's been writing about media and culture. He writes a perceptive must-read column for the Monday business section called Media Equation. As the first carpet bagger, he covered all the news, nonsense, and players in the seasonal Oscars race. And his brutally honest memoir, The Night of the Gun, was named one of last year's 100 most notable books. So please join me in welcoming our interviewer, David Carr, and our very special guest, Oliver Stone. scared I'm sitting next to Oliver. The, um, a couple years ago I was doing a story about film financing in Louisiana and specifically people shooting uh, films in Shreveport and Shreveport has a lot of good locations, a very good sort of infrastructure supports the film industry, Louisiana has been very aggressive and they said, we have five movies shooting here. The only movie you can't go to, it's a closed set, is W. It's an Oliver Stone film. Me being a reporter, it's like, that's the one I'm going to for sure. And so, even though I was doing just this broad-based story about, uh, about production and what Shreveport was good for and stuff, I just whenever you tell a reporter they can't do something, that's what they're going to do. So I fought and fought and moved into position. Pretty soon I was like on the outer ring of the set and then they were walking me around it. Then I spotted where Oliver's trailer was. And lo and behold, by hook and by crook, I ended up in a trailer with Oliver Stone and I had not a thought in my pea brain. I just wanted to be there. <laughs> and he started in talking about America's history of cultural uh, uh, imperialism, about existentialism, about uh, the mixed out legacy of the current president. Of the, and, and, and my head just turned to red mist. I was completely unprepared. I've tried to do a better job today, including seeing Wall Street Money Never Sleeps. What a great movie. Who's seen it? We'll try, and keep, we'll try and keep the spoilers to a minimum, although judging from the box office opening at number one, uh, the biggest open for an Oliver Stone film ever, which is a pretty big uh, bump to get over. And just before we got up here, we found out that it, it opened in India as the biggest film ever for a non-dubbed film. So this, this movie has legs. Um, and there's a reason for that. It, it, it's as current and as sort of of the moment as your and mine's bank account, however diminished it, it might be. It's about America's obsession with leverage, with more, 
was getting more than their uh, share. I wonder, I left there worried as hell about America. I went with my 13 year old and I just said, well, this is the country you're gonna get. Good luck. I wonder when you got done meeting it, it, it making it, if you it, 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 if you're depressed about sort of where we're headed. Oddly enough, not at all. <laughs> I uh, had the opposite reaction. That's why I put the David Byrne music, David Byrne and Brian Eno, they uh, philosophers and they have a sense of irony, uh, whimsy, you could call it, that this thing is a cycle. It's a bubble, and we have bubble imagery in the movie, as you know. And I and I. Look, uh, you're as old as I am, I, or maybe a little younger, but my father was in Wall Street and he saw the Depression and he used to talk about it. He saw World War II. And of course, I saw the 1960s bubble, and I say it's a bubble, it's just as big as this one because my life was at this place in the 50s and then with the Vietnam War, everything started to get crazier. Uh, the, the sense of inflation, of, uh, of expectations, the high society, bigness, Everything got bigger during the, the 60s, partly because of the Vietnam War's uh, inflation of body count. So I saw that and I said, wow, this is quite a jump. I felt the evolutionary jump. Right. And then quantum leap. 70s I don't think of as, as a leap. I think of it as a time of long sideburns and John Travolta and uh, Henry F the Fonz and stuff that wasn't particularly exciting to me. The 80s we had Ronald Reagan and I took another unexpected leap forward uh, with Ronald Reagan. It was, whatever you thought, it was the age of greed, the age of consumerism, possessions. Materialism became a god, more so than ever, although it was always an American obsession. But you know, it was on, we saw more CEOs on magazine covers than ever, and yachts, and Robin Leach, I just thought of him. The uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous became very popular as an early reality show. Then in the, t uh, Okay, that's the second bubble, and I was never going to be the same again. And then in the late 90s, I, after it occurred to me that this is all happening again in a, in a strange way with this hype over the internet, right. and this tech bubble, whatever you want to call it. it was in, prices were paid, what was it, uh, Warner Brothers paid at that point, was it two, three billion dollars for uh, time, AOL? Time it was Warner, just yeah. record setting. These, these numbers had a billion dollars. In the gecko era, it'd be like $100 million to, to buy into a company, or even $40 million was a big money. And here they're talking a billion dollars, $2 billion for a company that had no, had not even several quarters of profit. I mean, there was no sense of definition. There was the old concept of P&E, you know, price and earnings share, and there was just nothing there. And people were paying big money, so I knew we were in something different here. It was like another Vietnam type experience, or Reagan, and I, we went shooting <coughs> forward. That collapsed. But the economy, instead of readjusting in a strange way after 2001, kept going. And I never, it, it snuck up on us, true, we didn't, unless you followed the business news. So by the 2008 period, it was insane, I mean, theoretically insane to put $800 billion into a, into a, a bailout of, of all these net central banks that were now behaving like lunatics in a casino, like bookies. Uh, I, I, and I'm still not down from it, but essentially there's four bubbles in my lifetime. And I don't know that, how can we assume that there's not gonna be a fifth or a sixth if we, if we live that long? So the world of, that we're in has always been this constant rise to another level. Uh, of, in other words, the longer you live, everything you don't expect to happen probably will happen if, to quote, to paraphrase uh, David Byrne. At, at the heart of uh, the first Wall Street was I thought, I thought of it at the time as sort of the last word on the pathology of American business. And no more movies need be made about the things that greed will make men and women do. And yet, here we are, <coughs> back, still a very ripe topic. Back to the, back, back to a place where it's, it's the same forces, only it's all metastasized with more zeros behind it. I, uh, I would not have done a movie about the wealth because I thought it was uh, boring I had to celebrate wealth until 2008 when there was some definition, some crime and punishment aspect to it, a sense of karma coming, uh, coming home to roost. 
And there was. I mean, we, we, the trust between us and the banks and the trust that should exist in society is, has been diminished. Uh, the whole issue of credit bubble, the idea that the Federal <coughs> Reserve Board in the movie, I don't know, those of you who've seen it, knows there's two, two very important Federal Reserve Board scenes. In one of them, they let Bear Stearns go, or the, the equivalent of Bear Stearns. In the other one, they, they bail out the banks. And that's a big deal. It's too big to fail. So that bubble involves the concept of overnight money markets. At one point, Josh Brolin says, if you let us go, all the banks in this room will be out of business by the end of the week, which was what I heard about that, uh, specifically about Goldman and, and Morgan would be the last two banks to go, the investment banks to, to fall. And uh, this is all because of the overnight money markets and the credit and the, the money market itself, the concept of credit parties, <coughs> the concept that your credit, I mean, at this point you have to realize uh, uh, Sachs, Goldman Sachs had almost like Ten billion dollars in equity and, and uh, probably a oh, hundred billion dollars in equity and trillion more than a trillion dollars in, in assets. A hundred billion in equity, a trillion dollars in assets, and they were liable to fold at any point that week. So you understand the immensity of the uh, credit <coughs> and the concept of trust. If you don't have the trust of the person in the street who somehow at midnight decides that your your money's no good, you're in trouble. Yeah, but if you were in that room, that second meeting where they kind of got their, their finger poised over the bubble and it's going to say it's going to be like dominoes, they're all going to fail. Um, and I mean you not as a director, I mean you as a human being with fairly progressive political values, wouldn't part of you want to say, screw them, let them tumble? Absent consequence, the moral hazard going forward will be too significant, and unless there is consequence to these economic decisions. These guys will never learn, so let's just put on the nut cup and let them fail. That's certainly the big question that will come and haunt us historically, because I think a lot, of, a lot of the traders at that time said, let it go. Let it go. Let it sink. There will be some, what will happen? What would happen? I'm not enough of an economist, but I think there'd been some... The, they would have been replaced. These banks would have been replaced by smaller versions of some banks, and they would have come on by now, two years later. I'm sure that they would have been a working, they'd been a working capital. The government still had the money. The Federal Reserve Board had the money. The question was with these banks, and I think they scared us. They scared us very effectively, and everyone, even, even in Congress, which balked at first, went along with it, because you had to. There was a consensus in the air that you have to do this. You know, the, 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 the issue of too big to fail comes up, but there is also a broader message in your film that this financial services, which is this activity of staking, taking the same dollars, the same trillion dollars, and passing them around back and forth, and giving out the illusion that that's an economic activity. That, that we as a country, I, I, one of the themes I sort of came away with is yeah, forty percent of what we do is just pass some money around. That we don't make stuff. The forty percent of the corporate profit in the United States in two thousand eight, more than forty percent was actually corporate finance. It was shadow banking and financial services. Up until nineteen eighty six, as, as I remember it, it was from nineteen seventy three to nineteen eighty six. It never veered above sixteen percent. So, from eighty six, you jump from sixteen percent to forty some percent. That shows you that the the productivity of this country is about now become about financial services, not about productivity. My father, used, who was a stockbroker, used to say there should not really be profit without production. And that was the, uh, the emphasis that was mentioned in the first Wall Street, and it's also obviously an issue in this Wall Street, but what does, what does our country make? We do make things. We're still a big manufacturing base, but we, that has been diminished. The worker, the worker role in, 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 the, in our employment, in our, in our so-called you know, let's say the employment of our workers has been diminished significantly, and the wages of our union workers have been flat since 1973. Since 1973, they have not per capita earned more. Keeping up with inflation has been about it. Right. So it's a very difficult situation we're in. And it's, a, it's a little hard to watch Germany, which still has an industrial base, China, which We, is, we do too, but it's, it's diminished considerably. Well, the... the, the your, your, your movie gets at that in, in that in that the sort of 
there's the dark side that's going after each other for payback, for advantage. Uh, very well played by Josh Brolin. I, that guy in leather is just like, you know what? We should look at this movie a little bit. Let's run the tra trailer to start with, just, just so those of you who haven't seen it can see what it looks like. Someone reminded me I once said, greed is good. Now it seems it's legal. Because everybody's drinking the same Kool-Aid. Now I've been considered a pretty smart guy. And maybe I was in prison too long. One watch and one mobile phone. But sometimes it's the only place to stay sane and look out through those bars and say, is everybody out there nuts? Gordon Gekka was one of the biggest names on Wall Street before he went to prison for insider trading. That name doesn't mean anything anymore. If it weren't for people who took risks, where would we be in this world? You might want to wipe something the jewel off your face. Please allow me to introduce myself. Gecko! My name is Jacob Moore. I'm an married daughter. I've been around for my daughter hasn't spoken to me in years, and you know it. I never knew my dad is a peaceful person. That always scared me. I know it sounds crazy, but it will change. He's not who you think he is, Jake. He'll hurt us. Why don't you start calling me Gordon? You want to be part of the family business. You got my attention. But when you don't know what you're doing, it's fatal, Mr. Moore. So much you don't know, Jacob. They took my life, and when I got out, who's waiting for me? Nobody! This is not about the money. This is about you and me. It's about doing the right thing. It's about the game. I did tell you, Jake. I did warn you. It's easy to get in. It's hard to get out. Is that a threat? Absolutely. Okay, so you don't have to, we'll, we'll leave the geopolitics behind and talk about all the cool people in this movie. You don't, you don't have to watch much of that trailer to see Michael Douglas really at the height of his powers. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you probably would have never stepped back to this movie if he wasn't around and interested, right? He was, he was Ed Presman and he had asked me to come on. Yeah, they wanted to do it again. I was skeptical because uh, 2006, nothing had, it was the continuation of that period. I didn't want to go back. After 2008, it had a reason for me. And Gecko was the hook because he would, he'd, time had passed and he'd learn, had he learned a lesson, had he changed? And I think the key to the movie is that he's on the outside looking in at the beginning. And the key to the movie is you, you think he's learned a lesson, but maybe he hasn't, but maybe he has. You know what I mean? You, you're, 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 you're really trying to spot him morally throughout this film about, and um, uh, there's a scene with uh, 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 Shia on the subway where he's, he's, you can see a sort of spider to the fly setting the hook. Let's, let's run the clip and you can see what I'm talking about. What are you? Some kind of energy freedom fighter? No, no Mr. Gekko, I'm in this game to make money like anybody else. So what about money, Jake? You like her? Do I like her? I've never, I've never thought about money as a she. Oh, she lies there in bed at night with you, looking at you, one eye open. Money never sleeps. And she's jealous. And if you don't pay close, close attention, you wake up in the morning, 
He's young, and his big dream is to fund a big fusion reactor, which both has, will produce green energy, which he is impressed by, and green money, which he is into. I mean, let's talk a little bit about him as a character, like what, how, you, how you thought of him. Well, I think he's an idealistic young trader, completely different than Charlie Sheen, who was Frankly, Charlie wanted to make money, and he didn't care how he made it. He was willing to sell out the labor union and his father in the original. Here, I think Chaya has a different set of a generational uh, idealism, as does Carrie Mulligan. But it comes into conflict with the power of money, and we all get tested. At one point, he does pass false rumors against Josh Brolin, which is illegal, malicious rumors. But a lot of people are doing it on Wall Street. And of course, he uses the, the power of rumor is sort of a sub theme to the movie. Is it, there's two huge montages where we show what a rumor can destroy companies, as they did with uh, with Bear Stearns and to, and to a certain degree with Lehman Brothers, rumor. And the other thing he does is, as you know, uh, I don't want to give away too much, but he does betray his girlfriend, his fiance. Right. And I think he he does it for what he thinks are legitimate reasons. But that's what money makes you do. It makes you do things you don't want to do. Everyone in the movie at one point betrays the other, uh, another person. It's the nature of the uh, Wall Street game. Well, you being, having worked in Hollywood on and off for so long, I'm surprised that you would take such a dim view of human nature. Everybody is just. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, had, uh, I do, you know, I, some people would say that this is a love story because actually there's some things that have, the values that really matter, Gecko sees in the end. Gecko is not, he changes, but he's not changed. I mean, he's a, he's a very much a deal maker. Uh, giving 10% of what you've made back uh, to get a, uh, something you want is not a bad deal for Gecko. Some people have said that he's soft. I don't think he's soft, but uh, that's, uh, Gecko is older, and he's, he's racked with uh, experience, and as, as he says, with his, he's lost his son. He's lost, he's no one to, when he comes out of prison in that very first scene that you saw, the hardest, the, the key to the movie is that no one's waiting for him. He has nobody there. His daughter will not talk to him. She will not give him any satisfaction. He has nobody ahead of him except mortality. Nothing ahead. Part of what I thought made this an Oliver Stone film, and I'm a, I'm a fanboy, I'll admit it. I love your movies, always have. I, early on, I thought, <coughs> who was the guy that would pick up both the gun and the camera? And, and, and go off and, and, and make all these wonderful films. So it pretty much had me at Platoon, had me at Salvador. The, 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 um, the thing about this movie is everybody's got an arc. A lot of movies you just have one person and everybody pivots around. Even Shia's mom, who's kind of a middle class stand in the Long Island realtor, right? And she catches the virus. She just wants, she keeps putting her kid up for money because she's addicted to what everybody else is in this film, which is leverage. She was a good nurse and uh, she wasn't, she makes more as a realtor. She's flipping houses for money, like everyone was, a lot of people were doing, and she gets in way over her head. She, as you said earlier, she was, she becomes addicted, addicted to the deal, which is a problem with what happened. I think it's interesting, this movie, there's no labor union. In the 1980s movie, the labor union still mattered to some degree, although Reagan had broken the back of them. But in France or Germany, labor unions still have power, even in England. But in America, you don't hear about labor unions. They don't factor into the equation. 
what, the, the way labor unions got hurt in 2008 was that they were the uh, receivers, they were fucked over by the, because the, uh, uh, the banks and uh, the insurance companies sold them uh, pension fund, labor union pension funds, they sold them uh, subprime securities, which were junk. So they got hurt. So the labor union's dead as, as, an, as a social factor in American history right now. One of the things that, uh, that I, I thought about while I was watching this, there's always the tendency of human prerogative to raise the head of, of, of what someone gets. I mean, Josh Brolin, we, we, when Shia LaBeouf asked ask him, what number will make you sit still? And he just, you give him like three full beats and then he just says, four. Everybody's, I think envy everybody has a wants just a little bit more than, which is what leverage is about. It's a game. At that level, it's a game. I mean, it's, a, it's a cruel game, but it's really, it doesn't matter how much you have if, if you're winning or losing. <coughs> well, one of the things that, 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 that I was struck by in these Federal Reserve scenes are, I mean, they're amazing cinematic set pieces, and you have allegedly the smartest guys this mostly guys in American finance gathered around room and when in fact if you pull back a little bit they sold instruments they had no understanding of and got clobbered and tipped the com company over. I mean as you worked your way into the narrative of the film and the sort of heart of it, were you stunned not by how smart these guys were but how dumb they were? You know, it's. I think the shock waves are still setting in. I don't. I don't. I think you find out as you go, but you don't realize the implications or size of it. In a sense, what happened was that the Gordon Gecko of the 1980s, who was a crook, insider trading, became the banks of the 2000s. Inside information became acceptable. It became a norm. Uh, counterparties, the concept of everyone knows your business, everyone knows your debt, everyone's trading with everybody else. There was, it, it, it's, it's not, the, the concept of a securities business has lost its meaning if the, if the rating system is, is, is incompetent, which it was. Or complicit. Or complicit. And uh, of course, the regulations were diminished over 30 years by three different administrations, which is a shame unto itself. So the whole thing came to this place where I realized that we're trillions of dollars, trillions and trillions of dollars, far more money than we ever dreamed is on the line. And at one point, uh, Brolin says that we don't have any concept of how many trillions of dollars are, in, are out there. No one knew in 2008 how dangerous it was. They didn't know where the bottom was. And the idea was to let the mortgage market go and to see where the bottom was. And they still haven't resolved it, by the way, because Fannie Mae and uh, Freddie Mac were taken over by the government. And that's still a mess from everything I hear. And no one has really gotten to the bottom of this mortgage problem. Uh, uh, Elliot Spitzer, the, who was very helpful to us because he investigated Wall Street, suggested uh, the other day to me that if the government had given that same money to the, towards the mortgage market and controlled the mortgage market, now instead of to the banks, it would have made a huge difference. We'd be out of the hole we're in, which is uncertainty. Right. We're a patient still on medication in a hospital. We've had a triple heart attack, and we're still taking medication. We're alive, but uh, one economist called it the illusion of normalcy, which I think is a great terminology. Do you think that, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to boil it down too much, but part of what happened is bankers were looking at hedge fund guys and saying, I'm dealing with the $5, bill, $5 million bonus. And the schmuck down the street, he's no smarter than me. He's getting a $50 million, an $80 million bonus. And the banks more or less just changed their businesses, not on a dime, but organically over time. Well, they were allowed to, too. I mean, there was the whole concept of commercial banks becoming investment banks. The Glass-Steagall Act was repealed with the help of Robert Rubin, who was our Secretary of the Treasury at the time, right. and who then went on to enrich himself as perhaps the richest, uh, uh, richest ex-Secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary ever. Right. At, he went to he gets credit he for went, good, good market timing in terms of what he pulled out. Well, I remember when he was a hero. He was on the cover of Time Magazine, and Rubin, and with, uh, Greenspan, and uh, uh, Larry Summers, those were the three heroes. All well, the time. geniuses that built this world that we currently live in. They and deregulated it, and they had their reasons, but those reasons were never really valid to those people like Paul Volcker and Carl Stiglitz. And there's people who are calling this shot. 
And they were, uh, it's, the regulations were thrown out the window. It's Reagan's idea. Clinton continued it. And Bush Jr. never even had any interest in running government. So it was all across the board. You know. <laughs> now we're in the, it's a different place. The bubble, I might go back to my four bubbles. I mean, I really don't know what's going to happen. I think these are most interesting times, but it's scary. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, and I think it's uncertainty principle will rule. I frankly don't know, when you open the newspaper in the morning, I think you, many of you share the idea, you don't know what's going to happen with the markets. You don't know if it's go they're going to announce it's going to slide, and they say it's disappearing over the edge. Next week is the end of the banking system. I think we're ready for anything, and I, and I think uh, be ready for the fifth bubble. For me, it'll be the fifth bubble. For you, I don't know how many you have. Um, well, I just want you to give me a phone call when the next bubble comes so I can go sh short it and make some money. The, um, if, the, if money is still viable. Oh, no. Well, I'm going to show up with two sticks in Iraq. Worth, you might be an Iraqi di dinar. Is might yeah, be worth more. The, um, one of the things that I think we forget about uh, um, when the bubble burst is no one knew really what was going to happen. There were like those three, four days about, are my toes touching bottom right eight? Two weeks, do, yeah. Do, do, do I really need to go to the bank and put my money in a mattress right now? I think what the scene, the scene you had where they're walking in the park and Shai is talking to the great, great Frank Langella about, <laughs> boy, if, if you like this guy's work, he, I, I mean, this, this role, let's just run this clip. I, I don't need to tell you how good he is. How's your day going, huh? I told you. Good day, I'm okay. Bad day, I'm okay. Stop bugging me on my feelings. They're irrelevant. I wanted to come see you face to face and talk about these rumors, you know? Because it's getting crazy. It's out of control now. I'm hearing it from all ends. So much you don't know, Jacob. What? What about the bonuses then? Why now? Because I know you. You're holding out for something better. Well, don't. Spend it. Use the money, because one day you're going to wake up and you're going to be dead. Well, you got to get yourself together, all right? We're going to be fine. No matter how bad this thing gets, we have real equity in this company. You know that dream you got about that little energy company in California? You yes. Know, you may not get there, but you hold on to that. Because everything else is just noise. It's not just noise. There's 15,000 jobs in the line. 15,000 people here. That's not noise. Are we going under? You know, I never liked this damn door. Lewis, are we going under? You're asking the wrong question, Jacob. What's the right question? Who isn't? Pretty big kick in the stomach there when you're sitting there in the movie theater and watching that. Um, you know, I'm going to be cutting the questions here in about two minutes, so do we have microphones out there? Or what are we doing? Yes, we do. Because um, uh, Oliver very much wanted to spend time talking, uh, answering your questions in addition to my uh, silly ones. The, um, one of the things I notice about all, you've made very important uh, New York films, including this one, but World Trade Center. The, the New York, New York was a character in this film, but it was like a New York I'd never seen was was up high, it was, there's very little of the street, and the, the, the city had this gossamer sort of sculptural quality. It was just remarkable to look at. Number one, how did you get those shots? Is that just like a, a, a helicopter flying around? Or number two, what, what were you thinking about in terms of, was it supposed to look like Oz? Was it supposed to look like you know, a, a, a hell that was all dressed up? Or? Well, having grown up in New York in the 40s, 50s, 60s, I, I wanted to pay homage to this. It's really become architecturally stunning in the city, and it, it looks quite different than it ever looked to me. So it was, you know, and money is impersonal, and there's an abstract quality, a cold, as you say, godlike quality to it, and I think the buildings, the, the gleam, the night and the day, but above all, the most important thing when you shoot that is frankly, to have good weather. Uh, but you can't do much with a cloudy sky. So we did have a series of great blue days last October. We had a horrible September last year. 
Uh, it was a back and forth, but October really bloomed into a wonderful blue sky. I had the same problem, I, incidentally, on 9-11, uh, the World Trade Center, because that was all in one day, and it was a blue day, 9-11. So we had this problem with weather, and we didn't have to shoot only on the blue days to go down towards the World Trade Center. Once they get in there, it doesn't matter. But I remember we had to go back several times to shoot the blue days. So getting a blue sky in New York is a big deal. And we had quite a few of them in October. So that made that possible. And it was clear, clean. clean. They've also cleaned up the pollution <coughs> in New York. I think you know that from right. the old days. And the, right. uh, so there's less haze. Uh, helicopters, yes. And also we did a wonderful uh, wire shot up the side of a building with one camera. That's not digital. We, in the, early in the movie, when the uh, credits are introduced, we were going all the way up to, to the top of a, of a skyscraper from the street level. That's quite a shot uh, by Rodrigo P Prieto and his crew. Uh, I think of the uh, one thing I always thought about was I grew up on the East River, looking at the East River, and the movie uh, tends now towards the West River, the Hudson. Yeah, River. you're on the uh, West Side. Most the, of yeah, it. if you look at Wall Street and you go around it, it feels more. It, it leans more now towards Jersey. Right. When I was a kid, Jersey was the place you never went to. It was the the, the wilderness was the Indians were out there. But now it's uh, we ended up shooting in Jersey. It was a lovely experience in Jersey City. We shot the trading floor, the big trading floor there, and we. And had, you even gave Jersey City some love shooting across the river. Yeah, you, but it, the city le leans west, and whereas uh, the the east was more Europe, I think now it's going more towards Jersey. So uh, I I particularly like the Hudson River. I've fallen in love with the Hudson River. In fact, I think it's kind of a, a locus uh, locus for me in the world, and I can see myself starting my life on the East River and ending on the West River. Um. The. Uh, the first movie was kind of like a little bit of Pilgrim's Progress in terms of thematically. What, can you think of uh, either historical or literary allegories for w what you thought of when you were making this movie or what you read or what you, or did you just conjure it? You know, I think it's a little different because Pilgrim's Progress, it was a story of Charlie Sheen going to, <coughs> He started out as a, he's, he's cutting corners at the beginning of the movie. He's, right. his, his ethics are in question, and then he finds, once he screwed his father, he screwed the labor union, he understands what he's done. And he comes to an assessment of himself, which is harsh, and he's willing to take the sentence for it. So it's a relatively simpler movie. Though this one, we're dealing with six people, including Susan Sarandon, and they, they do, they're, they're swimming around in this tank. And I say it's a systematic failure of the system. That, that brings them down. Everybody is hurt. Everyone adjusts their own way. Who gets out, who doesn't? Bro, uh, I'm not gonna give away the ending. One of the characters you know, goes off, and he's gonna be indicted. Another one gets into a sort of a mortal injury, you could say. Uh, the, and what, where, where uh, Shia and Carrie end up, because they're the younger generation, to me is very hopeful. They stay, and I think that's the future. And whether Gordon Gecko is what he is, you have to decide for yourself. As I said earlier, it's a 10% deal. And as to Susan Sarandon, she does go back to nursing. I'll give that away. Right. And there is, uh, there, 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 there is a hug to this movie. It's just with a lot of sort of mayhem around it and uncertainty. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, Gordon Gecko in the first movie, obviously one of the great characters ever. And we're all thrilled to have two more hours with him. Um, he was obviously the villain, but he was also so charismatic and he made greed look sexy as well as good. So concerning where the world went afterwards, did you ever feel any sense of responsibility for making greed look so damn good? So much fun. Well, you know, it's all in the eye of the beholder. If you, f if you think it's sexy, and I think it is, like certainly it is sexy, money is sexy, there is something about it. But you know, how much, how, how many yachts can you water ski behind is a line. I'd like one. Here. <laughs> and you only need one yacht, right? And you can't even water ski behind a yacht. So think about that. It did get crazy and it got ugly when you found people making, the, I mean, the, the union worker never, is, his salary is flat and the CEOs are making a thousand times what the union workers make. It does get crazy and I think it speaks for itself what happened. I, uh, I don't feel responsible, no, because Gecko went to jail at the end of the movie. You know, he was a bad guy. But I think people were attracted to the glamour of the markets. In the new movie, it's not the same satisfaction for some people. They, they want to go see Gecko be bad. Unfortunately, 
the movie has to start on another premise. You see, it's, he's looking out, looking in. So it's more, to me, it's more human, humanistic because he's an older man and he suffered. The original Gecko is a one-note character. Whatever you, whatever you think, he's one note and he's superficial and he's great at it. Thanks. Young lady. Young lady, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to thank you so much for respecting movie audiences. A little louder, please. I'd like to thank you so much for uh, respecting movie audiences and giving us intelligent films. Thank um, you. They're beautifully shot, uh, brilliant, um, but it's just it's such, such intelligence that goes into it. My question is, what drives your passion in making your films? Is it a need to tell stories? Is it to answer questions? What, is, what fuels your passion? For me, the yes. passion of making this movie? Uh, all your films. Oh, well, each one is different, you know. Okay. I mean, for example, W, uh, where you interviewed me, I, did, I could not stand George Bush's policies. I made that clear in my personal comments, but really I was not, was not my role to, be, uh, to do a documentary. I was in there to understand why, who he was and how he became president. And I think I answered it for myself, a sense of the con how you could be an American and come up to be the president like that. And in this movie, it was really a curiosity because after 2008, Obviously, the Wall Street had entered a new dimension, as I said, a bubble, a new bubble. And I was, as a son of a stockbroker, I was curious as to what had happened. Also curious to what's going on in New York. And for me, it was a great chance after World Trade Center to come back and stay here. What about um, the Hugo Chavez movie you made? What, do you, what did you make of the election the, the other day when Hugo got away just by the hair of his chinny chin chin? Well, that, you know, that's a half a glass of water one way or the other way. It depends how you look at it. If you, if you look at it as a uh, person who admires Chavez, you'd say this is a very good sign, very healthy. The opposition had never been part of the uh, opposition. They'd never taken, they'd dro they boycotted the last elections. So it was only inevitable that they would, that they'd have now assume a shape. And I'm glad they're there because the other way they were very dangerous. They were plotting with the New York Times, you know, to uh, for coups to get rid of them. Yeah, I'm, and, get, and, I'm getting incoming and, reports on my headset. And, just as I mean, there was so much. Let the coup begin. There was so much. Ne there was a coup. That I don't want to go back into that. But there was, you know, there was such negative reports on Chavez. I think this was a healthy election. It shows you once again that it's a transparent process that he's gone through. And I think if they don't want him, they will, you know, he will go like Obama. He's got his approval rating is down. It's very hard to be a leader for, for uh, 10 years, very hard. People get tired of it, it's natural. This man is a Democrat, he will step out. You're confident of that? I am confident of it and he's behaved impeccably. There's no money in his bank account. He, his father was a, was a public official. He's got a tr strong sense of public service and the eco economic figures say that he's helped the poor enormously in this country, much more so than any previous administration in the history of a colonial Venezuela. It's sort of like being the tallest leprechaun, actually. Oh, come on, David. That's I'm not just, I'm, I just, I, I had to get one cheap shot in. I didn't use Tin Pot Dictator. I didn't say those it's words. It's easy to dislike him if everyone in the United States is I think he's names. No, I think he's a, he's, he's, a, he's a remarkable figure. And if nothing else, I mean, South and Central America has been a persistent sort of interest of, of your filmmaking. and. I think he's been a clarion call to the world that we are not your tchotchke, we are not your plaything. We are, we, we have our, our, our own dreams, our own objectives, which may or may not coincide with yours. And to that extent, I think he's been a great wake up call to, you know, America and, and places uh, beyond. Go ahead, sir, before I get in a lot of trouble. I was just gonna say, Oliver, I love your movies. Do you have any feeling on the financial reform bill that was just passed? I mean, do you think these, I, uh, it's several thousand pages long. I don't think many people have read it, except for the lawyers who are looking for loopholes. But uh, uh, Barney Frank <coughs> promises this, and you know, I would like to believe him. Uh, it, it will be in the execution. There are some, some of the rules on the surface make a lot of sense. But you know, how they interpret them, if, if for example, the 3% hedge fund thing becomes tier one capital, capital uh, under that definition, they can stash billions of dollars in that hedge fund. And so banks could continue to be hedge funds. But there's no question that Goldman and those, those type of things, why are they holding banks? They should not be holding banks. They don't take any deposits. I don't get that. And I don't understand why. I don't know what a bank is anymore. I don't know about you, but 
All I know is we're in a lot of trouble when I can only get 1% at the bank, or one and a half if I'm lucky. I don't know where the, I don't know how you feel about that, but this is the first time in the history of this country where there's no money to be had with money. You can't make money. So we're really kind of in a stagnation, and the banks are not there for us. So the system is, is not really good to older people or to people with, who want stability rather than to have to be forced to gamble with their money. You know, I've watched your career for a long time, and every single movie you make, you become an absolute expert on what you're talking. Your ability to absorb, process, make this stuff cinematic, and then come behind and talk about it, regardless of what it is. I just, I don't know, as a journalist, I, I find it breathtaking. Ness, go ahead, please. Um, a lot of people have compared you to a good book, like a J.D. Salinger, Catcher in the Rye or Dostoevsky, how do you see yourself as a book? I'm sorry, compare me as to a book. As a book. As a book. As, as a, a book. book. How would you see yourself? Because a lot of people, I mean, like he, he just said, oh. whatever it is that you're going after, whatever it is that you're filming, you become an expert at it. And you can back up whatever it is that you film. So put yourself in as a book. How would you see yourself? I try to. I, I'm sure I make mistakes. I'm everywhere. I'm just, I believe, I'm passionate, I care. I think it's like hitting a fastball. You want to do it, you know. So that's part of the fun is you refine yourself. Now, the key is not to become a wonk. You can't make a wonky movie. You've got to figure out a way to make it a dramatist. You have to tell a story with, no matter what, it's Wall Street is still a background. It's not a documentary, and I have six characters in the foreground, and I want to concentrate on those and get you involved in those six people. That's my job. W, for crying, you know, oh my God, you know, W himself, he becomes Josh Brolin, the way he plays him. If you follow the movie, you can follow his steps, you know. That's, and Nixon too, by the way, the rich, uh, Anthony Hopkins, uh, for me, Nixon was, again, the devil in many ways. But to, Anthony Hopkins humanized him for me. Um, I think we're going to have to, um, this is going to have to be the last question. I, I want to point out that we've, we've made it through the whole, 45 minutes, there's been no gaffes. There's been no, which is really uh, actually a public speaker, speaker speaking our unvarnished truth. That's what a, what a gaff is. I'm, I'm, um, you made it, made it through the whole uh, 45 minutes without ending up something that's going to be on a blog somewhere, but you still have one more shot, Oliver. And, and I'm dependent on you. So make it a spicy one. <laughs> Okay, I will. Oh, no. So this is Advertising Week, and you're speaking at an advertising event, Advertising Week event. Do you have, have you, or do you have any relationships with advertisers when it comes to your films, whether those are marketing <coughs> partnerships or product placement? Yes. <laughs> Can you be a little bit more specific? <laughs> Can you be some more specific, please? Oh, we've, I've always had relationships in every movie through the years, but this one, specifically because New York is the center, uh, one of the centers of the universe, and also because we were approached by a lot of advertisers. We didn't take them all. Sometimes <coughs> it didn't fit and didn't work. But, you know, for example, Starbucks would have been, uh, some traders told me, he would have been drinking Starbucks instead of Dunkin' Donuts, but we had Dunkin' Donuts. So, you know, I don't can I, care. Can I have I don't, a follow-up question that, to that? I don't think that disqualifies the movie. But on the other hand, uh, we did need product placement. It did help us enormously. Uh, I'll tell you because- Were the energy drinks product placement? I believe so, I, yeah. I believe so. Uh, we did need it because we had a tight budget. It was New York and we had a $60 million budget from Fox and Fox is uh, known as a tight studio. So we had tax credit, we got the tax credit from New York but we needed every dollar because we're shooting here and I have to say we shot fast. We shot in 58 days, which is the same amount of time we shot the original in in 1987. So we kept to the old schedule. And as you see, the movie is fairly large. But we needed help. And we took it where we could without, I think, prostituting the movie. So these were, these were cash for placement and, and partnerships, too, in terms of marketing? And yeah, it took various forms. You know, sometimes it would just be a placement, like the motorcycles, I would imagine. The motorcycles were very high level prototype. One was a million dollar bike apparently. Mm -hmm. So that's a prototype. Ducati was the other one. I'm sure there was a deal with them. 
there were deals all along the line, but nothing, as I said, I don't think that there's anything that's struck me as a, certainly maybe the terminals, the computers. Uh, Lightstream was there, Lightstream, if you remember correctly. Uh, Skybridge, Skybridge, uh, hedge fund. And also the party, uh, J Tom Joyce, uh, I don't think he put any advertising in. Knight let us shoot there. I mean, I don't know, every deal was a little bit different. But no, you know, no big, big cash, no, no Gillette uh, shaving cream, anything like that. <laughs> there was no scene that we did out of the way specifically to accommodate. Um, at the, it's somewhere in the movie, who says life makes you humble? I'm not gonna gaff, that's not in it. Maybe, Maybe you said it. Maybe I did, but, well, so, so, well certainly I, life, in, in, in the Gecko's character, life makes you humble. As you can see, I mean, he, the thing about Gecko I like is that he's, he, he convinces his daughter that he's really back and he wants to be her dad. And I think, I love that, uh, what he's really thinking, we're gonna find out. But if, if, if you got the number one movie in America, and everybody's talking about your film, and as you, when, you, when you leave here, everybody's going to be licking your face and tell you what a genius you are. I, how do you stay, stay humble? I, I don't see it that way. I think uh, people who know me uh, know that this is all temporary. You know, one weekend, number one, great. You know, let's try to hang in there for this weekend and the next weekend. This is a tough business. I'm glad the world opening is good, too. We're, we're doing well internationally. And, you know, it's, an e it's not an easy movie. It's not, you know, there's no guns, and it's hard to uh, keep the suspense and when it's financial matters. We're tracking older, 65% uh, over 30, so clearly it's not a young person's movie. I hope, I mean, I do think young people are seeing it, some people, but not in the quantities that we'd like. So I'm, I'm modest about it. I think it's, you know, if it, if it does modestly well, I'd be very happy, really. No expectations anymore. No expectations. I very much appreciate you taking the time to spend time with us.